And of course, we are Baptists are not Protestants. We understand that. But Baptists, our history is kind of interspersed between a lot of different Catholic authors that hated us, Protestant authors that some were more sympathetic towards us and some hated us as well. But, uh, you know, and then some some uh, writings that were that were hidden and hard to get to. Or you have the uh, one of the good resources. Uh, I don't have it up here right now. It's somewhere. But but uh, Martyrs Mirrors is another one that that would be sympathetic and and a, and a lover of those baptized martyrs of the faith and would tell the story of them. OK, uh, so we get our we gather our history from a number of different sources, even people that hated us would write about what they did and the history of those baptized believers. So we, we're going we're gonna to kind of finish up with the Albigenses. They're right here. And this is where they're, they kind of fade out as, as a group in sense and kind of merge into the other groups. The Wal they would merge into the Waldensians. We're going to talk about the Arnolists, the Henricians. All of these we're going to kind of talk about here over you know, the course of the next next uh, few weeks or so or months or whatever, we'll kind of, because the wall then, this is a huge one. The boudoir, the, that's a huge group and that's a huge time, that's a thousand year time period. That's a lot of time. So really we're gonna go back in time from where we are, well, where we're gonna finish here, kind of go back and, and follow that trail of blood. And that's what it is, it's a trail of blood. So you're gonna go back and you're gonna kind of pick up where where they are, and any one of these groups could be like mixed together. You have the Anabaptists here where he's got that written Anabaptists right there, which that's they all were. That's what they pretty much were in that sense. So you're going you're gonna to have that until the time of the Reformation. These groups are going to be in obscurity, and these groups are going to be, they're going to be in important places, though. They're going to be in places that are um, important for uh, uh, revival of principles that would be lost by mainstream churches, but they would continue on to hold these same biblical principles. They would not waver from them. They would hold them, and they would die for them. Well, now we're going to read, and this is going to come from some, J.A. Wiley is a great historian, and obviously we're not going to agree with everything that he says, but he's going to talk about, like, the, the, right, the, the papal uh, slaughter of the Albigenses and how they did that. And this is really going to close up that group, besides a few comments that we'll make in the future, a little bit about them, because the, the Saracens, they, they kind of, they were the, the, the Mohammedans and that group that would kind of bleed in, and they would, they would be in some of those lands with them. And there would be like somewhat of a confederacy at first, uh, just peace from the they, the, the Anabaptists, the Albigenses, they would always want peace. They, they were peaceful people. They, they, never, they didn't start a fight with anybody. Everybody tried to kill them. They weren't like fighting people. They weren't like, hey, let's get into a fight today. Let's go fight the Muslims. They weren't like that. They weren't like the Baptists and George Bush uh, that were staying the course, right? That were staying the course and slaughtered Muslims, that you didn't find that. In fact, what you found is these Albigenses trying to live peaceful wherever they were. Well, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? That's the, they just were trying to be good people that did what they were supposed to do. And Romans 13 Christians, they just, they followed the Bible. They, they tried to live for God and tried to love their brethren and, and their fellow man, their neighbor, and they witnessed to him and told him about Christ. And we heard last week, you heard about some of those people, how they were persecuted because they were in those lands of the Saracens, the, the Mohammedans and all those others. And what happened? Well, the Pope would get together with the Muslims and then there'd be a battle and then they would all kill the Baptists. That's how it works. That's how it's always worked. Why do you think in these modern day wars, do you know who, the, who they talk into going to these modern day wars? The Protestants and the Baptists kill them. You know who they start fights with in all these other lands? Right, but you know who they send off to war are the Protestants and the Baptists. Those people get bamboozled into going to fight their wars and they're on the front lines and they're the ones that get slaughtered. 
because they want him dead. It is a part of that war. That's, that's a spiritual battle that's there. That's why I'm telling you something that I believe, and you're going to remember I said this. They're going to try to get people like us fight their wars because they want to kill us off. I believe that wholeheartedly. Like, I, I do believe they want our children to go die in the sand for their wars, wherever they are. And they want to trick them into fighting those wars. They just do. They want that, that's what they want. So remember that. Remember that when you see a right-wing fascist dictator rise in America that wants to rally the Christians right, to go fight. Just remember that, because that's what they're going to try to do. They're going to use every scheme in the book to get you to try to do it. What's that? Right. So it's real. It's, that's, and it's, it's, spirit, it's spiritual for us to remember that and to stay out of it and be like, no, I don't think so. We know what war we're fighting. It's with this book right here. It's with this sword. That's the battle we have for the hearts and souls of men. It's way more important than anything else. So, the Crusades against the Albigenses. The torch of persecution was fairly kindled in the beginning of the 13th century. Those baleful fires, which had smoldered since the fall of the empire, were now relighted. But it must be noted that this was the act, not of the state, but of the church. Now, remember when he says the church, he's talking about Rome. That's what they mean by that. The, 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 you have to understand that every time that they say that when they're discussing that, they're mean, they mean Rome. Rome had founded her dominion upon the dogma of persecution. She sustained herself lord of the conscience. Out of this prolific root came a whole century of culminating edicts to be followed by centuries of blazing piles. It could not be but that this maxim placed at the foundation of her system should inspire and mold the whole policy of the Church of Rome, divine mistress of the conscience and of the faith. She claimed the exclusive right to prescribe to every human being what he was to believe and to pursue with temporal and spiritual terrors every form of worship different from her own till she had chased it out of the world. The first exemplification on a great scale of her office which she gave mankind was the Crusades. As the professors of an impure creed she pronounced sentence of extermination on the Saracens of the Holy Land. She sent there some millions of crusaders to execute her ban, and the lands, cities, and wealth of the slaughtered infidels she bestowed upon her orthodox sons. Wait a minute, are you saying the Pope, the papal see, tricked a bunch of men into going to fight crusades and to kill the moose lambs? Wait, I've heard this story before somewhere. Where, where was that? Where have I heard that before that we're going to turn them all into glass? We're going to bomb bomb Iran. Where, I, I've heard that story somewhere. If it was right to apply this principle to one pagan country, we do not see what should hinder Rome, unless indeed lack of power, sending her crossed missionaries to every land where infidelity and heresy prevailed emptying them of their evil creed and their evil inhabitants together and re-peopling them anew with a pure race from within her own orthodox pale. Sound about right? That's what she did. What would stop her from taking over the whole world? That's what the Crusaders army was. What do you think the United States government's army was over in the Middle East when they went over there and they did that? When I, what do you think that was about? Right. Because Saddam Hussein was a mean guy. So we killed all the Iraqis because of it, because of looking for those WMDs that they joked about. But now the fervor of the Crusades had begun sensibly to abate. 
The result had not responded either to the expectations of the church that had planned them or to the masses that had carried them out. The golden crowns of paradise had been all duly bestowed, doubtless, but of course on those of the crusaders only who had fallen. The survivors had as yet inherited little save wounds, poverty, and disease. The church, too, began to see that the zeal and blood which were being so freely expended on the shores of Asia might be turned to better account nearer home. The Albigenses and other sects springing up at her door were more dangerous foes of the papacy than the Saracens of the distant east. Yeah, you know who was more dangerous to them than the Muslims? Christians, Bible-believing Christians were the most dangerous thing that Rome had to contend with. It wasn't the Muslims. They were afraid of the saints, the true saints, those that followed the scriptures. They were a danger to the papacy. They always have been. That's why they always try to kill them, to wipe them out and to exterminate them. For a while, the Pope saw with comparative indifference the growth of these religious communities. They dreaded no harm from bodies apparently so insignificant and even entertained at times the thought of grafting them in on their own system as separate orders or as a purifying force with the advent of Innocent III. What a name, right? However, came a new policy. He perceived that the principles of these communities were wholly alien in their nature to those of the papacy. You think? that they never could be made to work in concert with it, and that if left to develop themselves, they would most surely affect his overthrow. So what was the Pope worried about? Well, these people are going to get saved and start churches, and they're not going to listen to me, and I'm going to lose my power. Because the gospel is the only thing that destroys that. It's the word of God. It's the gospel preached. It's the Lord's true churches that destroy the power of the papacy. This King James Bible broke the power of the Pope. Broke it. It just broke it. It, it did. It, it broke it. This one broke it. And he knew it. He knew it would. All of them knew it would. That's why they kept people in ignorance in the dark ages. Dark was to keep them away from the scriptures and keep them away from the gospel truth. Any type of understanding and intelligence and wisdom from the Word of God, they wanted dark. So you had to learn it from a priest or you didn't learn it at all. And what you learned from the priest was not biblical salvation. Accordingly, the cloud of exterminating vengeance, which rolled here and there in the skies of the world, as he was pleased to command, he ordered to halt, to return westward, and discharge its task chastisement on the south of Europe. Let us take a glance at the region which this dreadful tempest was about to smite. The France of those days, instead of forming an entire monarchy, was parted into four grand divisions. It is the most southerly of the four, Narrabone Gaul, to which our attention is now to be turned. This was an ample and goodly territory stretching from Daphne's of Alps on the east of the Pyrenees on the southwest and compromising the modern provinces of Languedoc or Gascon. It was watered, watered throughout by the Rhone, which descended upon it from the north, and it was washed along its southern boundary by the Mediterranean, occupied by an intelligent population. It had become, under their skillful husbandry, one vast expanse of grain field and vineyard of fruit and forest and tree. To the riches of the soil were added the wealth of commerce in which the inhabitants were tempted to engage by the proximity of the sea and the neighborhood of the Italian republics. Above all, its people were addicted to the pursuits of art and poetry. It was the land of the troubadour. It was a farther embellished by the numerous castles of a powerful nobility who spent their time in elegant festivities and in blithe tournaments. In other words, it was basically a peaceful time. It was a peaceful place. And the Albigenses were allowed. They had their churches there. They served the Lord there. They preached the gospel there. People were saved there. People were prosperous there. Not wealthy beyond imagination. like Not like that, but just... In that time, they were a peaceful people, and they, they lived and loved one another, and they were just kind people. They were, they, that's what they did. But better things than poetry and feats of mimic were, 
of mimic war flourished here. The towns formed into com communes and placed under municipal institutions enjoyed no small measure of freedom. So they were fr they were free. Why? Because the Pope wasn't there. <laughs> he wasn't he wasn't taking his papal army in there to destroy them. They were they had a they had a government where the the leaders of that government was like, well, we're not gonna let them be. Just leave them alone. Just leave them alone. What do we say? Just leave us alone. That's we we don't want anything from you. We want you to leave us alone. Amen. So Greg Dixon, again, hits what he said to him when they asked him, what do you want from us? He said, I don't want nothing from you. I want you to leave us alone. Mind your own business. But they can't do that because they want control. The lively and poetic genius of the people enabled them to form a language of their own, namely the Provencal. In richness of vocabs, vocables, a softness of cadence and picturesqueness of idiom, the Provencal excelled all the languages of Europe and promised to become the universal tongue of Christendom. Best of all, a pure Christianity was developing in the region. It was here on the banks of the Rhone that Irenaeus and the other early apostles of Gaul had labored, and the seeds which their hands had deposited in soil watered by the blood of martyrs who had fought in the first ranks in the terrible combats of those days had never wholly perished. Influences of recent birth had helped to quicken those seeds into a second growth. Foremost, listen, listen, this is why the Pope hated it. Foremost among these were the translation of the New Testament in the Provencal, the earliest, as we have shown, of all the modern versions of the scriptures, which would have been 11, 1189, 1209. The barons protected the people in their evangelical sentiments, some because they shared their opinions, others because they found them to be industrious and skillful cultivators of their land. Well, well, why did they protect them? Well, because they were honest people. All they did was preach the Bible and live for God and help their fellow man out and grow fruits and vegetables and take care of things and produce things and, and do good. So they were like, well, just leave them alone. Let them do what they want to do. They're not hurting anybody. They help. Some of the leaders were Christians. Some of those leaders were, were saved people that believed in the same thing that they did. They got converted by them. They were saved people. Others just saw the goodness of those people and said, they're a profitable people. They're good people. Just, they're fine. They do a good job. A cordial welcome awaited the troubadour at their castle gates. He departed loaded with gifts and he enjoyed the baron's protection as he passed on through the cities and villages, concealing not unfrequently the culprit and missionary under the guise of the songster. So, the, so these, these Albigenses would travel around preaching the gospel, singing hymns and preaching the gospel and traveling around. They were at peace, the barons, and they left them alone. Well, whatever, they're just doing their thing. They're preaching the gospel. They're... The hour of a great revolt against Rome appeared to be near. What was happening is Rome saw the Albigenses and they saw the revival of the Albigenses and they started to get nervous and they saw what was happening there. The gospel was being preached, people were being saved, churches were being started, Rome had no foothold there and the government that was formed there just left them alone and left them in peace. Well, they couldn't have that. They couldn't have that at all. Surrounded by the fostering influences of art, intelligence, liberty, Primitive Christianity was here powerfully developing itself. So basically, revival was taking place there. People, things were growing. Why? Because they weren't stifling it, number one. They weren't stopping it. They weren't being killed. It seemed verily that the 13th and not the 16th century would be the date of the Reformation and that its cradle would be placed not in Germany, but in the south of France. It looked as if that whole area there, that revival would break out there and that Rome's temporal power would be taken out and, it's, and, and destroyed right there. Well, don't think that Mr. Innocent III didn't see that. It was making him mighty nervous. Why? The Bible always makes them nervous. They don't like the scripture. They have a real problem with the scriptures being given. They, in fact, they do everything they can to keep people from them, whatever they can. Now they just make up fake scriptures and give them to them like they've always had, like Origen had, right? In his mythological Septuagint. Get to that this. It seemed verily that, uh, okay, anyway, we'll keep going. 
The penetrating and far-seeing eye of Innocent III saw all this very clearly. Now, at the foot of the Alps and the Pyrenees, only did he, see, did he detect a new life in other countries of Europe, Italy, Spain, and Flanders and Hungary. Wherever, in short, dispersion had driven the sectarians, he discovered the same fermentation below the surface, the same incipient revolt against the papal power. Wait, yeah, every time he drove them out? Well, what do Baptists do? Well, wherever they had to go, they went and behold, they started a church. And then they'd force them out somewhere else and they'd start a church. Well, guess what? Churches affect communities. Churches affect areas. And then they're starting to build this sentiment of the Bible alone is the authority. Reject infant baptism, reject the papal system. By nature, listen, this church, by nature of its being, our church here, by holding that these scriptures are, is against Rome. I mean, our, our existence is against it. And that can't be for them. He saw it and it frightened him because it was spreading like it always does. He resolved without loss of time to grapple with and crush the movement. He issued an edict enjoining the extermination of all heretics. The edict enjoins bishops, counts, governors of castles, and all men at arms to give their aid to enforce spiritual censors against the heretics. That would be you. If you were alive, that would be you. Exterminate. You know, like you call an exterminator to get rid of roaches? They called exterminators to get rid of Christians. Bible believing, holding to the scriptures, baptized believers. To exterminate them. To treat them like they were bugs. To treat them like they were animals and put them down. At is what they held to. That's the goal. He issued the edict enjoining the extermination of all heretics. Cities would be drowned in blood. Kingdoms would be laid waste. Art and civilization would perish, and the progress of the world would be rolled back for centuries. But not otherwise could the movement be arrested and Rome saved. A long series of persecuting edicts and canons paved the way for these horrible butcheries. The Council of Toulouse in 1119 presided over by Pope Calactus II. What names they have. Pronounced a general excommunication upon all who held the sentiments of the Albigenses. Cast them out of the church, deliver them to the sword of the state to be punished, and included in the same condemnation. Listen all who should afford them defense or protection. So you, they may not have been an Albigense, but they might be the neighbor to one. Like, well, I don't want to kill my neighbor. I don't want them to die just because they believe that. Yeah, but if you harbor them, if you hide them, if you help them, if you fed them when they were starving, they'll kill you with them. That's how you turn every man against every man, right? Is threat skin for skin. All that a man hath will he give for this life. Satan said, right? This canon was renewed in the Second General Council of Laterne, 1139, under Innocent II. Each succeeding council strove to excel its predecessor in its sang sanguinary and pitiless spirit. The Council of Tours in 1163 under Alexander III stripped the heretics of their goods, forbade under penalty of excommunication any to relieve them and left them to perish without succor. The Third Council of Latrine. Is that Latrine? Is that like, is that, did I say that wrong, Brother Paul? Or is it really, it works for you too? Isn't that a toilet? Yeah, that works for me too. I kind of like that. What's that? Yeah. 
1179 under Alexander III and joined princes to make war upon them, to take their possessions for a spoil, to reduce their persons to slavery, and to withhold from them Christian burial. Do you know what that means? No, they didn't cremate them. They left their bodies out to rot. Yeah. Same spirit, huh? One papal edict that they gave was not to let, they could not bury their dead. So eventually they probably did burn them. Right? The bodies are sitting there. What are they going to do with it? They won't let them have a Christian burial. Well, now you have people that don't want a Christian burial. They want a heathen burial, and they want to burn their bodies. People get mad at me because I preach against cremation. It's like, that ain't in the Bible. God said bury the dead. Jesus got buried in a tomb. Amen. I'm getting buried like my Savior. Amen. I ain't going to follow the heathens. Well, it's cheaper. I don't care. Here's cheap. Give me a box. Build a box. Throw me in it. Throw me under six feet under. I ain't there anyway. But do it the way God said to do it. Do it like a bunch of stinking heathens. Christians get mad as preachers preach against that. I'm going to be buried like a heathen. You want to burn like a heathen too? What's the matter with you? Oh, it's cheaper. Well, that's a shame. It shouldn't be, should it? Yeah, it is pragmatism. I don't want to burn like they burn babies at Planned Parenthood. Do you? Sickos. Anyway, but that was the one that they did. They withheld that Christian burial from them to, to shame them. Now you got people that'll just do it. <laughs> Claim the name of Christ, right? The Fourth General Council of Lateran bears the stern and comprehensive stamp of the man under whom it was held. The council commanded princes to take an oath to extirpate heretics from their dominions, fearing that some, from motives of self-interest, might hesitate to destroy the more industrious of their subjects. What, just out of common sense, they're like, you know, I don't want to kill the best, best people in my country. I mean, these Christians are good people. They, they, they're kind to everybody. They help everybody. They pay their bills. They do what they're supposed to do. Why would I want to kill them? This is what these leaders are saying. Like, why do I want to? I don't want to kill these people. Why would I want to? They didn't do anything wrong. Oh, okay. Well, we'll make sure you want to kill them. So here's how they did it. Fearing that some from motives of self-interest might hesitate to destroy the more industrious of their subjects, the council sought to quicken their obedience by appealing to their avarice. It made over the heritage, heritages of the excommunicated to those who should carry out the sentence pronounced upon them. Oh, in other words, if I kill you, I can take your land. I can take your property. I can take everything you have. Well, that would make somebody that's greedy a filthy lucre, right? That would make somebody, well, sure, I'll kill you then if I get to keep your property. That's what they did. They enticed them to kill and murder. That is wicked. Still further to stimulate to this pious work, the council rewarded a service of 40 days in it with the same ample indulgences which had e earlier been bestowed on those who served in the distant and dangerous crusades of Syria. If any prince should still hold back, he was himself after a year's grace <laughs> to be smitten with excommunication. His vassals were to be loosed from their allegiance and his lands given to whoever had the will or the power to seize them after having first purged them of heresy. So if you, if you had a leader that said, you know what? The Pope can go kick rocks. I'm not going to kill anybody. Okay, if you won't, then you know this young and up and coming man that wants to, uh, wants to rule? We're going to entice him to do it. Then he's going to kill you. He's going to excommunicate you. You're going to get killed and he's going to take your position. Kind of like Jezebel did, yeah. Well, same spirit. That's what they did. But also they, they promised, we'll get to that in a second here. And his land's given to seize him. And having purged them of heresy, that this work of extirpation might be thoroughly done, the bishops were empowered to make an annual visitation of their diocese 
to institute a very close search for heretics and to extract an oath from the leading inhabitants that they would de they would delate to the ecclesiastics from time to time those among their neighbors and acquaintances who had strayed from the faith. Man, how do you like that? So you don't show up to church. <laughs> they come looking for you. They say, oh, they ain't being very faithful. You must be one of those Albigenses. So now we're going to kill you. We're going to steal everything you have and burn your burn your bodies and, and 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 kill your children. Boy, that's some Christian love right there, ain't it? Yeah, and you can just feel the love coming from Pope Innocent the Third. Great guy. It is hardly necessary to say that it is Innocent the Third who speaks in this council that was assembled in his palace in 1215. It was one of the most brilliant councils that ever were convened. Now, when he means brilliant, he doesn't mean that he's admiring it. He's talking about just uh, the number of people. The He's not impressed by it. He, he actually hates it. But he's just explaining that in terms of how amazing it was that all these people showed. Because it, it was composed of 800 abbots and priors, 400 bishops besides patriarchs, deputies, and ambassadors from all nations. It was opened by innocent in person with a discourse from the words of, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you. He's literally saying he's Jesus and he's eating this Passover. What are, what's the Passover? Well, the Albigenses, apparently. They're on the dinner plate. We cannot pursue further this series of terrific edicts, which runs on till the end of the century and into the next. Each is like that which went before it, save only that it surpasses in its cruelty and terror. The fearful pillagings and massacrings which instantly followed the south of France and which were reenacted in the following centuries in all the countries of Christendom were but two faithful transcripts, both in spirit and letter, of these ecclesiastical enactments. Meanwhile, we must note that it is out of the chair of the Pope, out of the dogma that the church is mistress of the conscience, that this river of blood is seen to flow. See, here's what the, where the Baptists always held to, what? Individual soul liberty, soul conscience, right? Uh, freedom of conscience. They always held to that. These people said you these these all the way back here from the Donatus on. No, you don't. You're not Lord of anybody's conscience. God is Lord of the conscience, right? You you can't tell people what what they have to believe or they they can believe or what they have to believe. You can't do that. But Rome saw herself as Lord of the conscience. Three years was this storm and gathering. It first heralds were its first heralds were the monks of Satu sent abroad by Innocent III in 1206 to preach the crusade throughout France and the adjoining kingdoms. There followed St. Dominic and his band who traveled on foot two and two with full powers from the Pope to search out heretics, dispute with them. See, what they did is they, they, they provoked them. They would provoke men. Well, what would you do? Here comes this, here comes this, um, this priest right? Or this monk, here he comes preaching his false Roman Catholic heresy. He comes walking in your town preaching it, and you're a Bible believer. You've got the scriptures in your hand in your own tongue, right? And I know that was 1200, but they had the scriptures in their own tongue there, right? And, and then here comes it. What are you going to do if you're a Christian and you're a preacher? What are you going to do? You're going to be like, I'm going to preach against that. I'm going to tell you that that's a lie. You're lying to people and you're sending them to hell. They, they ain't going to resist that. Would you be able to if you heard if you heard that devil preaching and lying to people and sending them to hell, what are you going to do? You're going to preach against him, aren't you? You're like, I'm going to lose my head, but I'm still preaching against you, devil. These people are going to know that you're a liar, that you're of your father, the devil. So he would search out the heretics, dispute with them, set a mark on those who were to be burned when opportunity should offer. So they picked him out. Remember, remember, remember when Jesus was there? And uh, the, they sent the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and they sent people. And what did they do? They sought him out. They picked him out. Right? Remember before the, before the Passover, they, 
they picked the lamb. You remember that? In Israel, in the Old Testament, before, the, the, the leaders or the elders would have to go pick out the perfect lamb, the spotless lamb, the slay. Well, that's the same thing that happened. If you study it in the book of John, you'll see that. Look, before Jesus was crucified, they came and they picked out the lamb. That's what they did. You study it, you'll see the same thing. Because that's what Jesus was singled out as the spotless lamb of God who should die for the sins of the world. And here, they picked, they marked out God's people just like they did Christ. They would mark them out. When, so they could be burned when opportunity should offer. In this mission of inquisition, we see the first beginnings of the tribunal, which came afterward to bear the terrible name of the inquisition. This is the beginning of the inquisition. It was against the Albigenses that the beginning of the inquisition would start. It would evolve into something worse. Could it be any worse? Yes, it could. It will be worse in the end times as well, right? But, but here it, it could get worse. These gave themselves to the work with an ardor which had not been equaled since the times of Peter the Hermit. The fiery orators of the Vatican but too easily succeeded in kindling the fanaticism of the masses. They are experts at kindling the, 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 the fanaticism of the enemies like the Saracens to get the Muslims ginned up to kill the Christians, right? To get Christians to kill other get professing Christians to kill other Christians. They were masters of it. Roman Catholics to kill Christians. They, they're masters. By the way, do you not think that that's possible today? That they can't get those people ginned up to do the exact same thing? Oh, you better believe it, friend. You better believe it's possible. Rome is not done doing the stuff she's done. She is still doing it. Like that, like that archbishop tried to tell me. I said, Rome has way too much power. He goes, oh, would that were only true. I said, Rome has way too much money. He said, would that were only true. We have to send a check to Rome every year. I was like, have you seen the papal banks? Have you seen their bank statements? That's what I asked him. Really, their investments? Have you seen them? He didn't, he didn't know what to say. He couldn't say anything. What could he say? It's a lie. You could sell half the treasures of the Vatican. And they're worth, they're probably worth a trillion dollars. That whole place. Ridiculous. The tribunal would, okay, anyway, let me see where, here we are. The fiery orders of the Vatic orators of the Vatican, but too easily succeed in kindling the fanaticism of the masses. War was at all times the delight of the peoples among whom this mission was discharged. But to engage in this war, what dazzling temptations were held out. The foes they were to march against were accursed of God and the church. Think about that. They, the Catholics were taught, they, they taught the Catholics, the papacy taught the Catholics that those others were accursed of the church. But it's okay if you kill them. God's going to reward you for killing them. What, did, what does the scripture say? That they that killeth you thinketh that they doeth God service. There it is. To shed their blood was to wash away their own sins. It was to atone for all the vices and crimes of a lifetime. That's what they taught them. Huh. Well, Muslims were taught and said that they would get, if they committed uh, acts of violence and killed the non-believers, what would they receive? How many virgins? Anybody remember? 72, was it? Right. That's what they would receive. Well, where'd they get that from? The Pope. They got it from their mama, their whore mother, Babylon. That's where it came from. The foes 
The foes they were to march against were a curse of God. The church to shed their blood was to wash away their sins. It was to atone for all their vices and crimes of a lifetime. And then to think of the dwellings of the Albigenses, replenished with elegance and stored with wealth, and of their fields blooming with the richest cultivation and to become the lawful spoil of the crossed invader. That's the Crusaders. Right? So what happened? Well, those, Walden those um, Albigenses worked hard had land, had crops, had everything, a nice place to live and, and everything else. And they said, well, if you just kill them, you can have everything they worked for. These people, they weren't wealthy people. They were just middle-class people that took care of things. And God blessed them. And they lived in a fruitful land, and Rome couldn't handle that. But this was only the first installment of a great and brilliant recomp recompense in the future. They had the word of the Pope that at the moment of death, they should find angels prepared to carry them aloft to the gates of paradise, open for their inheritance and the crowns and delights of the upper world waiting, for the, waiting their choice. They just killed the Albigenses. The crusader of the previous century had to buy forgiveness with a great sum. He had to cross the sea to fight the Saracens, to linger out years amid the unknown toils and perils, and to return if he should ever return with broken health and ruined fortune. But now a campaign of 40 days in one's own country involving no hardship and very little risk was all that was demanded for one's eternal salvation? Never before had paradise been so cheap. You get it? They convinced these people that if they killed, they were going to heaven. And they were going to get mansion. They could have a mansion here. They could have all the land of the people they killed here. They could live good here, and they have eternity. All for killing people. Man, that is sick, isn't it? That is just plain sick. Demonic, demented. Bullish. But that's what they did. The preparations for this war of extermination went on throughout the years of 1207 and 1208. Like the mutterings of the distant thunder of the hoarse roar of ocean, when the tempest is rising, the dreadful sounds filled Europe, and their echoes reached the doomed providences where they were heard with terror. In the springs of 1209, these armed fanatics were ready to march. One bloody, or one, excuse me, one body had assembled at Lyons, led by Arnold, Abbot of Satoy, and legate, the legate of the Pope. It descended, uh, it descended by the Valley of the Rhone. A second army gathered in the Agen Agenois under the Archbishop of Bordeaux. The third horde of militant pilgrims marshaled in the north, the subjects of Philip Augustus. And at their head marched the Bishop of Poi. The near neighbors of the Albigenses rose in a body and swelled this already overgrown host. The chief director of his sacred war was the papal legate, the abbot of Satoy. It chi its chief military commander was Simon de Montfort, Earl of Leicester, a French nobleman who had practiced war and learned cruelty in the Crusades of the Holy Land. In putting himself at the head of these crossed and fanaticized hordes, he was influenced, it is believed, quite as much by the covetous greed of the ample and rich territories of Raymond, Count of Toulouse, as by the hatred of the heresy that Raymond was suspected of protecting. The number of crusaders who now put themselves in motion is variously estimated from 50,000 to 500,000. So 50,000 to 500,000 soldiers are going to descend on the Albigenses and destroy them. They're going to wipe them out. For what? Because they weren't Catholic and because they believe God's word. The former is reckoning of the Abbot of Vaux, Cernay, the Popish chronicler of the war, 
But his calculation, says Sismondi, does not include the ignorant and fanatical multitude which followed each preacher armed with skies and clubs and promised to themselves that if they were not in a condition to combat the knights of Languedoc, they might at least be able to murder the women and children of the heretics. Do you get it? So the crazy Roman Catholic preachers would come out and get people to say, look, you may not be able to kill a knight, but you can at least kill their women and children. You can at least kill their little kids, right? I mean, for eternal life, can't you kill some kids? So you see, so, see, when you understand all this from the Bible first, and then you understand it from history, that's why I hate it all. I hate Roman Catholicism. I hate the church state. It, I hate it all. I hate it. It is anti-Christ and devilish to the core. Anytime one of those devils got in control of a government, they killed people. And guess who's going to get killed? You! Baptists are going to get killed. Bible believers are going to get killed. That's why I don't respect Calvin. That's why I don't respect Zwingli. That's why I don't respect Knox. I don't care anything about them because they were devilish murderers and prove it wrong. They won't. They all go silent and shut their big old traps when you tell them about it. They ought to lurk out and it, they, ought to, they ought to walk out with their tail between their legs being sad about it, but they're not. Because every time one of those people got in control of the government, guess who's going to die? These people died. All of them. Why? Because they got in control and power. And if you didn't believe like their whore mama believed, then you're going to die. Don't tell me not to be passionate about it. Nobody else wants to tell their story, do they? Shut it down, preacher. Don't talk about the Baptist people. Don't talk about these people that, they, that got murdered for holding up the faith. Exactly. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I have no respect for those because they're a church-state organization is what they are. And that's all they are. And they want to kill and they'll do it again if they get a chance. They're bloodthirsty. They're just bloodthirsty people that murder. And that's what they did to those poor people. And it wasn't ignorance. They knew exactly what they were doing. Zwingli knew exactly what he was doing when he drowned those people. They all knew what they were doing. They're guilty of it. And this is where that spirit leads. When you put the church and the state together, when you put the sword of the government together, when you do that, and this country right now is teetering on the edge of it right now. It is teetering on the edge of it. You watch. If it ain't Trump, it's going to be Ron DeSantis. And he's already stoking it up, man. It's, the ground swelling is there for it right now. You know why? Because people are going to get sick of trannies running around doing what they're doing. And they're going to get sick of it. And they're going to want old Ronnie to come in with the government and start lopping heads off. You think it's far away. I don't. I can see it. That's where it starts. It starts with that. It starts with another papal crusade. That's where it starts, and that's what that is. That's all George Bush's or th stuff was, was a papal crusade. That's all it was. They were the crusaders saving the, saving the world from the Muslims. It's so easy to see, friend. You just got to wake up and see it. And a lot of these reformers were right on it, man. They, they were right for it. Then you have independent fundamental Baptists that are supporting it and going yo pro military and waving their flag around and doing all this other stuff. It's like, really? Think about what you're saying. Wanting to kill all these Muslims again. Like you think again, paper for paper, fact for fact. Show me where Muslims are are as dangerous as gay white dudes up in Congress stealing everything you own. Show me. Show me where they are. Show me where those Muslims are more dangerous than what those dudes are doing in Congress. It ain't Muslims that stuck their hands down people's pants at the airport. Who was it? See, I'm just a fanatic, right? If I, you start talking like that, that's, that's a little, man, that's a little fanatical. Really, it is? Well, you know what? 
20 years ago when in 2000 when that stuff happened we all thought you got to be kidding me you're gonna frisk my wife you're gonna frisk this person you're gonna do you're you're gonna stick your hands down their pants you're gonna check some little kid out you have to check every blonde chick that walks in because blonde chicks blow stuff up all the time and you have to check them out all the time and you don't think and, and who did that who was leading that george bush brother bush yeah hey i got another one for you 20 years later who stuck you all on lockdown who did it obama that's who it was it was obama nah he was too busy being a queer it wasn't him doing he's married to one he's married to a man but he was too busy doing that right but no no who did that who did that Trump! That's a little inconvenient truth there, isn't it? Wait, you mean a, a right-wing fascist dude that loves trannies, by the way, put you and locked you down and then locked your churches down and then blamed Fauci with it when he's supposed to be the president, he's supposed to control everything? Yeah, I don't know why these guys don't pick that up, that, that like they don't catch the program there. Pretty easy, isn't it? I'm, ha I'm having too much fun. I'm almost done, sort of. Getting there. So right, surely they might be able to at least be able to murder the women and the children of the heretic. This overwhelming host precipitated itself upon the estate of Raymond VI, Count of Tolois, seeing the storm approach, he was seized with dread, wrote submissive letters to Rome, and offered to accept whatever terms the papal legate might please to dictate. As the price of his reconciliation, he had to deliver up to the Pope seven of his strongest towns to appear at the door of the church where the dead body of the legate of Castelnua, who had been murdered in his dominions, lay and be there beaten with rods. Next, a rope was put about his neck and he was dragged by the legate to the tomb of the friar in the presence of several bishops and an immense multitude of spectators. After all this, he was obliged to take the cross and join with those who were seizing and plundering his cities, massacre, massacring his subjects and carrying fire and sword throughout his territories. Stung by these humiliations and calamities, he again changed sides but his resolution to brave the papal wrath came too late. He was again smitten with interdict. His possessions were given to Simon de Montfort, and in the end, he saw himself reft of all. Among all the princes of the region now visited with his devastating scourge, the next in rank and influence to the Count of Toulouse was the young Raymond Roger, Viscount Count of Baziers. Every day, this horde of murderers drew nearer and nearer to his territories. Submission would only invite destruction. He hastened to put his kingdom into a posture of defense. His vassals were numerous and valiant. Their fortified castles covered the face of the country of his own town. Two Baziers and Carcinian were of great size and strength, and he judged that in these circumstances it was not too rash to hope to turn the brunt of the impending tempest. He called around him his armed knights and told them that his purpose was to fight. Many of them were papists, as he himself was, but he pointed to the character of the hordes that were approaching, who made it their sole business to drown the earth in blood, without much distinction whether it was Catholic or Albigensian blood, that they spilled. His knights applauded the resolution of their young and brave liege lord. The castles were garrisoned and provisioned. The peasantry of the surrounding districts gathered into them, and the cities were provided against the siege. Placing in Baziers a number of valiant knights and telling the inhabitants that only their hope of safety lay in making a stout defense, Raymond shut himself in Carison and waited the approach of the army of crusaders. Onward came the host, before them a smiling country, in their rear a piteous picture of devastation, battered castle, blackened walls, towers of silent cities, homesteads in ashes, and, and a desert scathed with fire and stained with blood. In the middle of July of 1209, the three bodies of crusaders arrived and sat down under the walls of Bazaars. The stoutest hearts among its citizens quailed, and they surveyed from the ramparts this host that seemed to cover the face of the earth. 
So great was the assemblage, says the old chronicle, both of tents and pavilions, that it appeared as if all the world was collected there. There were fifth, like hundreds of thousands of troops surrounded them. Astonished but not daunted, the men of Vizier's made a rush upon the pilgrims before they should have time to fortify their encamp encampment. It was all in vain. The assault was repelled, and the crusaders mingled with the citizens as they hurried back in the town in broken crowds, entered the gates along with them, and Bezier's was in their hands before they had even formed the plan of attack. The knights inquired of the papal legate, the abbot of Satoy, how they might distinguish the Catholics from the heretics. Arnold at once cut the knot which time did not suffice to loose by the following reply, which has since become famous. Heal all, heal all, the Lord will know his own. The bloody work now began. The ordinary population of Bizeers was some 15,000. At this moment, it cannot be less than four times its usual number for being the capital of the province and a great place of great strength. The inhabitants of the country and the open villages had been collected into it. The multitude, when they saw that the city was taken, fled to the churches and began to toll the bells by way of supplication. They but sooner but the sooner drew upon themselves the swords of the assassins. Like you think those Roman, like they'd be ringing the church bells like those Roman papists would care. No, they fell upon them, those crusaders did, and they slaughtered them like the assassins they were. The wretched citizens were slaughtered in a trice. Their dead bodies covered the floor of the church. They were piled in heaps around the altar. Their blood flowed in torrents at the door. 7,000 dead bodies, says Sismondi, were counted in the Magdalene alone. When the crusaders had massacred the last living creature in Bizeers and had pillaged the houses of all they thought worth carrying off, they set fire to the city in every part at once and reduced it to a vast funeral pile. Not a house remained standing, not one human being alive. Historians differ as to the number of victims. The abbot of Satoy, feeling some shame for the butchery which he had ordered, in his letter to Innocent III, reduces it to 15,000. Stinking liar. As if that's a small number. One's a big number when you murder somebody. Others make it an amount of 60,000. The terrible fate which had overtaken by Zeers in one day converted into a mound of ruins, dreary and silent as any of the plain of Chaldea told of the other towns and villages, the destiny that awaited them. The inhabitants stricken fled to the woods and caves. Even the strong castles were left ten tenantless, their defenders deeming it vain to think of opposing so furious and overwhelming a host, pillaging, burning, and massacring as they had a mind. The crusaders advanced where they arrived on the 1st of August. The city stood on the right bank of the Aude. Its fortifications were strong, its garrisons numerous and brave, and the young Count Raymond Roger was at their head. The assailants, assailants advanced to the walls, but met a stout resistance. The defenders poured upon them streams of boiling water and oil and crushed them with great stones and projectiles. The attack was again renewed, but was as often repulsed. Meanwhile, the 40 days service was drawing to an end and the bands of crusaders having fulfilled their term and earned heaven were departing to their homes. The papal legate seeing the host melting away judged it perfectly right to call Wiles to the aid of his arms. Holding out to Raymond Roger the hope of an honorable capitulation and swearing to respect his liberty. Don't ever trust a papist. Arnold induced the Viscount with 300 of his knights to present himself at his tent. The latter, says Sismondi, profoundly penetrated with the maxim of Innocent III, that to keep the faith with those that have it not is an offense against the faith, caused the young Viscount to be arrested with all the knights who had followed him. He tricked them. That's what devils do. When the garrison saw that their leader had been imprisoned, they resolved along with the inhabitants to make their escape overnight by a secret passage known only to themselves, a cavern three leagues in length, extending from 
uh, Carasson to the towers of the Cabarades. The crusaders were astonished on the morrow when not a man could be seen upon the walls and still more mortified was the papal legate to find that his prey had escaped him. For his purpose was to make a bonfire of the city with every man, woman, and child within it. But if this greater revenge was now out of his reach, he did not disdain a smaller one still in his power. He collected a body of some 450 persons, partly fugitives from Caracasone, whom he had captured, and partly 300 knights who had accompanied the Viscount. And of these, he burned 400 alive, and the remaining 50 he hanged. There you go. We'll stop there. But this is the, these are the birth pangs of the, in, of the uh, Inquisition. This is what they did. Remember, they don't care if, they did not care if you were Catholic or if you were Albigensi. They didn't care who you were. They didn't care. Kill them all. Kill them all. Let God, God knows his own. See, this is what God foretold of. That they that kill you will think they do God's service. He told, he promised them heaven. All they had to do was kill men, women, and children. And if the oldest man would just walk up and kill a little kid, well, he'd get heaven. Because he wasn't able to take on one of the knights or one of the defenders. So he could definitely kill a little baby, right? And that would earn him heaven. See, what you, what you do preach matters. Amen. That's why we preach eternal life through Christ alone. That the only sword we're, we're to use is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We're not to kill. We're not to, we're not to, we don't, Jesus died for our sins. He didn't ask us to kill anybody. In fact, he says, love your enemies. The total opposite of what Roman Catholicism taught. See, but these people were in the dark. They didn't have the gospel. Who didn't join them? Well, these Albigenses didn't join them. Why? Well, they had the Bible. They had the scriptures. They said, we ain't doing that. What are you, we're, you're, they're the slaughtered. They're the ones that are being, they're going to be killed. You might be too. I might be too. But I'd rather die that way and live like a devil and murder people and join their forces with that antichrist system that's there. Remember, she's the mother of all harlots. Revelation 17, 18 tells us that she's the, Rome is the mother of all harlots. It's Babylon. And Babylon, who is Babylon? It's Rome. She's got a lot of little whore daughters. They teach the Muslims to do the same thing. That's... That's their religion. That's what they do. The reformers followed suit with the same thing. They got an authority, they killed. When they ran states, they killed. If they didn't kill them because it wasn't politically correct to kill them, well, they'd beat them and abuse them like they did in Massachusetts. Right? And by the way, what did he say when John Clark was on trial? Who remembers what... what um, Oh, I can't think of that guy's name. The, um, the Puritan preacher that put, uh, congressional preacher that put Clark on trial. What did he say? Was it Mather? I don't think it was. I, what's that? I can't remember his name, but I remember what he said. You ought to die for what you've done. Wait, what did he do? He preached the gospel and baptized a believer. That was a member of his church. Then, after he baptized him, but who requested him to come there. And what did he say? You ought to die for what you've done. That's what he told Clark. What was he telling him? If I could get away with it, I'd kill you. So what would they do? Well, those nice church state folks would just send them out in the wilderness without any weapons. And it wasn't really they were worried about the Indians so much as the wild animals that would kill them. But the Indians would kill them, but they, but they would send them out in the wild. But they made deals with the Indians like Roger Williams. You read Roger Williams' works, 
Roger Williams made, I mean, he made peace with the Indians. <laughs> they were peaceful men. And God used them. So I'm just telling you, that's, that's why we reject the church state model. We reject it and forever. See, we are the guys that scream, there is a different, there is a separation of church and state. We, right? But Paul told a story about somebody that got in his face one time and said, there's no diff there's no such thing as separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. Hey, David Barton. Amen. Say what? I thank God I'm a Baptist. I thank God I have this book. And I know why I believe what I believe. You couldn't talk me out of it for anything in this life because I know what the book says. I've seen it. I've watched it. I've seen God bless it too. Amen. Remember that. Blessed are the peacemakers, right? That's what God wants. I'm telling you what, I'm, it's coming around again. They always use the same game plan. It doesn't change. Those Roman Catholics, the papacy, not just the Roman Catholic people, but they'll use the billion Roman Catholic people. But the, the same play is coming around again. By the way, just so you know, Ron DeSantis, who did he work for? Well, he, was a, he was trained, he was a Jesuit trained. And what was he? He was the inquisitor at, uh, at uh, Guantanamo Bay. Yeah, he is the inquisitor there. They would, the troops wouldn't eat, so Ronnie went in and made sure, no, you're going to eat. He was the enforcer that made sure that those troops did what they were supposed to do. Or not the troops, the prisoners. Excuse me. Yeah. And Ron DeSantis made sure that... Yeah. Well, they said they force-fed him and all kinds of, like... All kinds of stuff. Yeah. So anyway, but stay tuned. I'll, I'll cover that sometime in the future, especially if we see that go anywhere, which I think it will. I think so. Yes. I, I mean, he was there for that. And then he rises to the Florida governor out of nowhere. Trump gives him a nod and he rises up to become the, for, the, the governor in Florida. He was a congressman. Then he rises up to be the governor of Florida. Jesuit trained. Definitely knows about being an inquisitor. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Stay tuned. Oh, it's going to get interesting, isn't it? Thank God for the Bible. You have the guide right here. You have the book. It's here. You have everything you need to know how, how you're supposed to respond to those things. Remember what God says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. We love God's word. We hold to it. Let's pray for these people. They need it desperately. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you. And we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the truth of it. We thank you for our rich history that we have. And Lord, if we lose our heads uh, by the grace of God, being saved by your grace, we know we're going home to be with you. And Lord, persecution will arise for the gospel's sake. Help us to be faithful. Help us to trust you. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah.